Welcome to this week's Noetta podcast and today's guest is someone with an extraordinary story. John Crawley is a former Marine turned IRA gun runner. His book, The Yank, is out in shops now. And John, you're very welcome on today's podcast. Thank you, Patricia. You were born in America. I was born in uh, Long Island, New York in 1957. Uh, I was the son of Irish immigrants. My mother was from Kerry, my father from Roscommon. My father had joined the United States Air Force for four years in order to get some technical skills and training, but mostly to accelerate his American citizenship. Uh, we moved to Chicago when I was about two, so I don't remember New York or anything like that. Um, and I grew up in Chicago and until I was about 14, and then we moved back to Ireland. I lived in Roscommon for a year. I went to school in Castle Ray for a year. In fact, the same school my father had gone to. And then we moved to Dublin, and I spent a few years living in Dublin. My father was a general contractor, a builder. And uh, I then left uh, in April 1975 to join the U.S. Marines with the specific intention of returning and joining the Irish Republican Army when I came home. I didn't have any particular Republican background, but I was a voracious reader. Um, I would have had a sympathy of the, of the entire Republican concept having grown up in the United States, which is a republic. Uh, every morning in school, we pledge allegiance to the flag, you know, and every school, I don't know if they still do it, but you pledge allegiance to the Republic and to the indivisible nation for which it stands, uh, a nation with liberty and justice for all. And I suppose those words always resonate, resonated with me, the Republic for which he sta it stands, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I always took a Republican um, uh, concept uh, in my political beliefs. So when I joined the IRA, I joined basically uh, with the high ideals of, of a Republican and somebody who wanted to fight the British occupation in Ireland and end jurisdiction in this country and build a national democracy within a republic. Now, of course, as a young man, that would have been probably the extent of my political analysis. It, it would develop as one matures and gains experience. But all through my life, I, I never altered in my belief in the essential uh, unity of Ireland. I know, like I'm very well aware that Ulster Unionists are a distinct community, but I don't accept they're a separate nation. And uh, I believe that it's, it is within the Irish people to uh, develop a, a national civic identity. And uh, that's basically was my primary political uh, belief that f led me to join in military operations as a volunteer in the IRA. You didn't have any influence um, from your parents, Republican ways. They, they, your parents were Irish, one from Roscommon, one from Kerry. It was from books that you read. Well, it would have been books, it really would have been, because I, I, I was always and still am a, a great reader of history and politics. I was never a, f a fan of fiction, even as a young fella. Um, no, I heard no, I suppose, as they would say, Republican propaganda at home. My father was Fianna Fáil. Uh, his granduncle had shot the last Irish seaman in the Tan War, 10 minutes before the truce sign was signed in Calcery on the 11th of July, 1921. And uh, so there was that sort of Republican ethos. But then, you know, my granduncle had gone on to fight on the anti-treaty side in the Civil War, but then he supported Del Valera, so he ended up joining the Guards in the 1930s. Um, so my father would have been sympathetic as a uh, to the notion of a republic, but of course uh, he wanted he wouldn't have wanted his son, you know, making uh, sacrifices for it or taking chances for it, you know. Uh, but he would have had that notional sympathy that that a lot of Fianna followers have. Uh, they'd support the state, support the institutions of the state. They would support the security forces of the state, and they wouldn't want to see that attacked or jeopardized. But they also supported, you know, the, the full freedom and independence of Ireland. My mother came from Fine Gael background. You know, uh, her, her family would have supported the treaty. And that's not to say that they're anti-Republican, you know, but it's to say that um, uh, they certainly were uh, not for the provost. And uh, so 
I would have heard no pro-Republican propaganda at home. And in fact, it would have been anti, you know, when things would have come up in the news and it's terrible and those people are doing that and this and that, you know. But um, no, I have to say that my, I, I developed my politics myself. I had no influence, you know. I remember uh, a branch man saying to me one time in, in the South, you know, you were probably from a, a respectable family, but you were brainwashed by some evil bastard. And I was wondering who this evil bastard was because I hadn't met him, you know. So, you know, it, it, that was basically it. I mean, sometimes people, they come to a belief. And I think what the situation in Ireland is, and has always been is you have three choices, really. Uh, when there's a conflict on, you, you stand idly by, you actively collaborate or you resist. And I made my decision. So you would have been about 12, 13 when... In 1969, there was a battle of the bog side. Mm -hmm. Things really started to, you know, yeah. break out. Violence broke out yeah. in the north. Yeah. Do you remember seeing that on the news? Would it have been on the news? Absolutely. It was on the news in America. And I didn't really understand about the situation at that age. And all I heard was Catholics and Protestants were fighting each other. And, you know, the British Army were in there to keep the warring sides apart. You know, not knowing at, at the time that the British Army and the British government were responsible for the warring sides in the first place. But yes, it would have been plenty about it on the news. And uh, But I had no real understanding of it. It's only when I came to Ireland, really, uh, as a young teenager and was talking to people. And it's, it's, it's sort of funny the way I first found that cleavage in Irish people of how they fall on a situation. Because I remember being in a house one time down the country and the people, uh, I saw a monument to some IRA men who had been killed by the, by the Tans. Two IRA men were, were, were killed by the Black and Tans or the RIC. And so I was asking about it, what's this about, you know? And in one house, uh, which would have been, um, I, I think a sort of Fianna Fáil house, they were saying, oh, you know, the Tans come in, murdered those men, those men were fighting for their country and they were killed by the British and all this. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I remember being in another house uh, and talking about it, and they had a completely different take. And I believe they were like in a Fine Gael house, <clears throat> and they were more or less saying that it was terrible the way people had to get up out of their beds and hide in fields because of the tans. And if the IRA hadn't been there and hadn't been doing anything, you know, they wouldn't have brought this disturbance on us. So it was a completely different take on it. One saw the IRA as freedom fighters. The others saw them as as nuisances who were, you know, disturbing the, their their quiet life and their quiet equilibrium. So, uh, while things aren't that simple or that binary, I do find that tendency in a lot of Irish people, you know. Mm -hmm. And John, when you were in America, mm -hmm. were you able to speak to like-minded people? Was there a sympathy there for the IRA and what was going on? There was initially, there was initially uh, among the Irish community over there, I would have found listening to people from all walks of life. And most of the people I would have known over there were from the south of Ireland. They were Mayo people, Roscommon people, Kerry people. They weren't from the north. I don't think I knew any northern people. But, you know, as time went on uh, and you had, you know, incidents happening and civilians being killed, people sort of turned. They sort of turned and it, it got much less supportive. And I think as the struggle dragged on, there was a sort of, you know, weariness with it. So I found that people who would have been maybe supportive in an emotional way at the beginning, gradually sort of became disillusioned, you know, over various things that were happening. And, uh, but there was always a, a, a core of support there. But I have to say that, um, like my family were never in Norway or any support organizations. I mean, any, Americans that I met as a young man weren't, you know, strident Republican supporters by any means. But I found there was very few Irish people that didn't have a notional sympathy with the idea of Ireland being a fully independent country. None of them, I met no, nobody that ever said the, the Brits should be in Ireland, but very few would say you should do anything about it. On the other hand, you know, s certainly nothing uh, to do with arms and, and uh, arms struggle. So it's just, it's just, you know, that's the way it is. I mean, uh, you know, in any situation, and I often think of the situation in France, I read a lot about the French resistance and, you know, 2% of the 
French population resisted and 98% didn't because it's, it's just, and you find that it's totally understandable. People want to live, people want to survive and they want to get on with their lives. And people who resist uh, are, are a very small minority in, in any country at any time. So you joined the Marines yeah. and, and you have said that your goal was to get trained up and then go home. And join the IRA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Join always IRA. home to me. Yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> I joined the Marines and uh, I outlined in the book how I wanted to join Special Forces. My, my cousin Ken Crawley in the States had been in the Green Berets, the United States Army Special Forces, and I intended to join them. But uh, my uncle Mike, who'd been in, from County Kerry, my granduncle Mike, had fought in the U.S. Navy in the Second World War, and he was very impressed with the Marines, and he was saying to me, well, you know, if you're going to join the military and do it right, the Marines are your only man. And uh, so to kind of keep him happy, I went to see a recruiter, a Marine recruiter, and I says, look, you know, the Marines are good and all, but, you know, you don't have special forces like the Army. And he says, well, we have the best special forces of all, Marine recon, and he went into this big spiel. But anyway, I describe in the book how I ended up joining the Marines and how I ended up eventually getting into recon, and I eventually became an instructor with reconnaissance teams. So... But there's one thing that, uh, you know, I have to make clear is I didn't join the Marines with this, like, you know, this view that I was going to come home and change the IRA for the better and make everything, you know, uh, more professional. I thought the IRA was this professional guerrilla organization that I kept hearing about. The most highly trained guerrilla organization in the world, the most, you know, the most sophisticated group. And I believe that <clears throat> when I was home. When I got my first leave home from the Marines in Christmas 1978, I remember on the news uh, there was a, an IRA attack in Cross McGlen in which three British soldiers were shot in the square by volunteers in the back of a van. And while I don't, you know, I don't, I don't rejoice in the death of anybody, it was, to me, it was an act of uh, real resistance against the hardest of hard targets in the hardest of hard areas. I mean, for them men to go into Cross McGlen, into the heart of that square and shoot dead three British soldiers under the nose of the barracks and get away, to me, was an act of phenomenal courage and resistance. So I have to say that I didn't have the opinion that the IRA needed my help. I did not think the IRA needed my help, and that's not why I joined. I joined the Marines to enhance my own professional development, and if I could help in any way when I come back, I would. But I really didn't believe that I was going to be some character that was going to change the IRA because I didn't think they needed it. I really believed the IRA was this professional, you know, uh, group. And it was only when I joined that I started to find out that things weren't quite what I thought, that um, very few people had professional training. Uh, some of the people uh, in charge were very amateurish. Uh, some people in charge were there because they were what I would consider a safe pair of hands. In other words, they would carry stories to leadership. They would, uh, you know, follow. They were spokes in the wheel. Whatever way the wheel turned, they would turn. There were there weren't that many people with the um, technical ability and tactical competence to bring things to where I believe they could have gone. Having said that, you know. Uh, there were men there in areas who were far more uh, better volunteers than I would would ever be, uh, were on far more military operations and far more effective than I could ever hope to be. You know, that's absolutely the case. But generally, generally, there was this amateurist, amateurishness and a lack of military knowledge and skill and I saw no need for it because it was very easily uh, fixed. The problems I saw were very easily fixed because it was easy to do things the right way. If you were procuring arms or training people, you know, it's as easy to do it the right way as the wrong way. And I noticed that when I brought some of my concerns to various people at a leadership level, I was more or less, I had the impression I was annoying them, really annoying them. They didn't want to hear it. Uh, whereas on the ground level, with volunteers on the ground, I always got a terrific reception. I mean, the guys doing the fighting wanted to be the best and most effective they could be against the military. I mean, I make no bones, no apologies that I felt we should fight the British military and, uh, and do everything we could to be as careful as we could so that, you know, we didn't endanger civilians or do anything 
that would bring disgrace or shame upon our, our, our struggle because nobody uh, wanted to, uh, nobody wanted to, everybody wanted to be part of a professional group of um, patriots, right? That's, that's how you wanted to perceive yourself. And when things went badly wrong or things that would happen that would embarrass you, you not only it was because it was morally wrong, but because it was, um, it was politically wrong. And, you know, you need to be inspired. To f in struggle, you need to be inspired. And it's hard to be inspired unless you're doing inspiring things. So what year did you actually join the IRA? And how on earth did an American who no one seemed to, to know yeah. end up becoming a member of the yeah. IRA? That couldn't have been... Well, I described that in the book, but I, I joined in 1980. I got out of the Marines in May 1979. In fact, I got out of the Marines on the 29th of May 1979 at 8 in the morning. And at 2 o'clock, I was on a connecting flight home for Ireland. Uh, I was on a mission. <laughs> so, so that's the next problem. Uh, unlike the Marines, which had, re which had recruiting offices, the IRA didn't. The IRA was an illegal organization in Ireland and in, and in the UK. And uh, the question was, how do you join a secret army when you don't know anybody in it? But through a convoluted process, I got work with a fellow who I knew had been a prisoner in Port Leach Prison. And uh, so I got to work in the same place, sort of repairing a building. And uh, of course, I latched on to him and rapidly, you know, he guessed my intention within days what I wanted to do. And he actually advised me against it. Uh, I actually remember him saying that he didn't believe that the leadership in Belfast or Derry could be trusted. I had no idea what he meant by that. And I thought it was somebody making an excuse to justify his own retirement from the struggle. So I brushed that off. Uh, but, you know, I persisted and persisted and eventually uh, he must have told somebody, you know, this guy is really keen. So a Tyrone man approached me one day and uh, it took a couple of weeks of interviews and meeting people. And then I was asked to go down one day to John Joe McGurl's pub in Ballinamore in Leitrim. And uh, I was sitting in uh, a little room between the bar and the kitchen. And uh, John Joe came in smoking a pipe and he just threw the green book on my lap and he said, read that. So that was the, you know, that was the, the, the start of the, uh, formally swearing me in the organization. And what age were you then? I was 23. 23. Did you find any of this daunting at all? No, no, I wanted to join. I was motivated to join. And uh, I, 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 um, I didn't find it daunting because that's, I was doing what I, I meant to do. Yeah. So that was 1980, mm -hmm. 1981, the hunger strikes yeah. happened. Yeah. Do you remember? Oh, do I remember? In fact, uh, ironically, it's like Forrest Gump. There's a you know, he's everywhere. There's actually a photograph of me behind the firing party at Bobby Sands' funeral. I was at his funeral. Now, pure coincidence, pure. I just, ha I didn't know the firing party were coming out there and ha happened to be standing there when they came out. But yeah, I mean, uh, the hunger strikes, uh, it was, uh, and when I look back at it now, and I'm 65, and when I look back at it now, and I'd be saying sometimes, my God, those men were so young. And then I, I have to remember, I was that age. That's the age we were, you know. That was, a, that was some generation when I think back on it, you know. And uh, it was a horrendous time. And it was awful frustrating that we didn't have the capacity to hit back in the way a lot of people wanted to hit back, which was, you know, against military uh, targets and that. Um, you need three things to win a war or to have any hope of success. You need the skill, you need the capacity, and you need the motivation. At the time we had the motivation, a lot of people didn't really have the skill, but we certainly didn't have the capacity because we didn't have the equipment, you know. But eventually, when the capacity did come in, years later, from the Libyan gear, which is, a, you know, a matter of public record, uh, there was still a lack of skill but I don't think at a leadership level there was the motivation to give us the skill. And eventually they would come to use that um, stuff as negotiating capital instead of as the capacity to wage an enhanced war of national liberation. Um, but I know I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a few years here. But uh, yeah, the hunger strikes, it was horrendous. I mean, you know, where in the world would you get 10 men who would starve themselves to death? One of the most brutal and agonizing deaths imaginable for the right to be treated as a, as a, as a, as a political prisoner in a political 
struggle. I mean, it's unbelievable what that man went through and what they had to go through. And I'm reading things now, like, I mean, you know, I would recommend anyone read Sam Miller's book on the brinks about what they went through during the no wash protest, you know, it is just horrendous, you know, and Richard O'Raw's books on the blanket. It's just, you know, I went through a lot uh, and in special forces training and all, but I mean, it, it was finite. It was a certain, I mean, these men put up with this for years, for years. And eventually, you know, we, we, well, we must remember there was actually 12 men died in August strike because Michael Gohan and, and, you know, um, Joe, Joe Stagg, I think it was. No, not, not Joe Stagg. I'm sorry, but died in hunger strike in England. So there was 12. And, uh, you know, where, 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 where do you get a, a struggle? Where do you get a cause? Where do you get an ideal that can produce patriots like that? You know, and looking back on it now, how do we, how did we go so wrong in the end, from my perspective, that we're now uh, pursuing royalty all over the country uh, whenever they come here because uh, former comrades have signed up to a deal in which there's perpetual institutional role for the British royal family, even in the so-called United Ireland, if it ever comes, of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, you know, the Republic, the Irish Republic has been dropped. And now we talk about the agreed Ireland and the shared Ireland and the new Ireland, which is not new uh, or agreed because it's predicated in all the old divisions. But again, I think I'm jumping ahead here. That's very interesting, John. And you've actually said previously that you believe the chance for a 32-county republic is dead in the water. Yes, because a 32-county republic wasn't on, at the table when they went to negotiations. See, we were always told that this would end with negotiations, which any rational person knows. I don't know anybody who believed we were going to beat the British Army into the Irish Sea. But those negotiations had to be negotiations that would somehow lead to our goal of a 32-county Irish Republic. Uh, but what the Brits do, and they always do, is they set the table, and there's only one, one or two items on the menu before you sit down, right? They did it with the Anglo-Irish Treaty, because during the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the Brits had already brought in the 1920 Government of Ireland Act. So Ireland was already petitioned before people even met for the negotiations. Uh, when the provost, uh, here's another thing too, you, we were often told to put it in perspective, we bombed our way to the negotiating table. We were not at, the provost were not at the negotiating table. The Good Friday Agreement was negotiated between the Dublin and London governments, right? The provosts were consulted on the periphery about prisoner releases and things. They were consulted, there was talks, but they were not architects of this agreement. No matter what they try to pretend now, they absolutely were not. So when you sit, but the only thing that was on the table, you see, and this was framed, you had the, the Downing Street Declaration, which they agreed to. You had the Mitchell Principles, which they agreed to. And then you had the framework documents, which they agreed to. And the framework documents said what way this was going to go, basically. The rest was all just window dressing. And the, the one thing that was not there was a, an Irish Republic, a 32 county sovereign Irish Republic was not in any of these documents and it was not on the table and it was not going to come out of negotiations. There wasn't a hope because it wasn't even a matter for discussion. So the Brits were doing again what they did during the Anglo-Irish Treaty was get Republicanism, Republicans to the table but keep Republicanism out. And that's what they did. And you have this agreement now that uh, at the time we were told, and I remember being told that uh, this is not a Republican document keep your feet on the ground, but maybe we can work things, you know. Uh, a friend of mine who was very close to a member of the Ar Army Council was told by this member of the Army Council, and I believe my friend, because he's never lied about anything in his life, he says the member of the Army Council told him there is not a single Republican fingerprint on this document, right? But they went ahead with it, and uh, people gave him their head, and uh, now we have a situation where they claim we have to protect our agreement, we have to defend our agreement, because what it did is it opened up career paths for people and it eventually became an end in itself which is what many of us said is going to happen if you get tied into this you know you're going to open up career paths for people you're going to tempt careers with careers and people aren't going to want to rock the boat or anything like that you know so but i want to make it very clear because when i talk about being you know against the good friday agreement which i am because i'm for the irish republic I am not, when we talk about the peace process, I am not against the peace. 
I am not against the peace. I'm totally supportive of the peace and I don't believe there's any one at the minute has the ability or skill or capacity to wage a war that would bring uh, the British jurisdiction in Ireland to a speedy and successful conclusion. It is not there. You would have no support for it and nobody would understand it, right? But I think I'm entitled to be critical of a process that cannot lead to Republican goals of an Irish Republic. Because the Irish Republic, for, for uh, since its inception, and Irish Republican was begun by Protestants. I mean, the, Irish, the United Irishmen were formed in 1791 by 28 Protestants. 26 were Northern uh, Presbyterians and two were Anglicans, Wolf Tone and Thomas Russell. And their proposition was to break the connection with England and to forge a national, a joint civic identity uh, to, to overcome the sectarian divisions, right? Uh, where we are now is we have this uh, so-called border pole that will lead to uh, a so-called United Ireland that trades geographical unity for continuing civic division because it says you can remain British or Irish uh, and Sinn Féin is chasing royalty all over the place because what they're saying is there's a continued institutional point of reference for uh, unionists in a continuing link with the crown. See, we were supposed to break the connection with England. We weren't supposed to enhance it. We were supposed to forge a joint civic identity, not keep the sectarian division intact in the so-called United Ireland. So I don't you know, see how any Republican could uh, be happy with that situation. But the thing is, you see, what I learned in time was People were fighting for two different things, basically. Some people in the IRA were fighting to get rid of the Orange State more than anything else. Uh, and uh, when they got rid of the Orange State, they were able to drink the Kool-Aid on the Good Friday Agreement and go on British pay, pay and pension, uh, act as junior partners for the British government. And that, but I'm uh, sorry, and then people who were like myself, whose primary focus was fighting the British state, are in an unhappy place right now because the British state is still in control here. They're still Would here. you say then, John, that some Republicans probably knew that a united Ireland may not be possible, but were happy enough just to get rid of the orange state, as you called it? Well, I think, I think they thought a united Ireland was possible, but they must have known that the Irish Republic was, was not possible. You know, and that, and I'm an Irish Republican, and that's what, what I wanted. But you see, it, it, they're talking about this shared island. You know, one of the things about the Good Friday Agreement that annoys me is what happened to our country? It's this island now. Nobody talks about our country. Uh, and sharing it with what? Sharing it with the British colonial mistakes? Sharing it with the uh, British colonial divisions that they've planted here? I mean, I don't, I don't want to share island with that. I want to unite with, uh, with uh, all sections of the community, uh, from all persuasions, under the common name of Irishman. And you know, I grew up in, the, in America, in the American Republic, and uh, the motto on its official seal is e pluribus unum, which is Latin for from many, one. And what they mean by that is, you know, you, you had your Irish neighborhoods and your St. Patrick's Day, and you have your uh, Italian neighborhoods and your St. Joseph's Day, you have your African-American, you have your Martin Luther King Day, you have your culture, you have your diversity, you have your difference, and you can cherish that, but you have one common citizenship. And uh, under the Irish Republic, nobody would be asking, you know, there's no question that Ulster Unionists in particular are, are, are a distinct community. Nobody would deny that. And nobody would deny that they have, uh, you know, rights as a community. But I don't believe they have the right to be called a, another nation. And, uh, you know, even Asquith, Churchill, um, uh, Lloyd George at the time were saying there's no way that Unionists are a separate nation. Although then when it suited them, you know, all of a sudden they became an, another nation. Uh, I saw in the news this morning that Prince Charles is visiting the four nations of the UK. Well, surely he's visiting the five nations of the UK because there's England, Scotland, Wales, and the two, na two nations in Ireland. And it's strange how, you know, uh, Ireland, Ireland is uh, one nation under British rule, 
But once we start talking about Irish unity, it's suddenly two nations. And another question I often ask is, how come the desire for to build a national democracy within a, a united republic is an aspiration, but the union's veto is a right? So there's all these, these issues in the mix. What do you believe would have achieved what you saw as an Irish Republic? Was it the continuation of violence or, you know, how do you... Not, 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 not the continuation for the sake of continuation. Not to fight a war as some sort of emotional relief because you think, you know, uh, there's no other way. But I mean, we had the capacity at the time. I believe, to bring the struggle to a point that would have put the British to the negotiating table where the Irish Republic would have been on the table. And I firmly believe that. And a lot of people that I know and respect believe that. And that's what we should have done. But instead, you know, things were allowed to dribble on, dribble on, dribble on, until people were so worn out, they would accept it nearly anything. You know, so, and I think that, you know, I think the dark hand of British intelligence was in there too, in the mix, helping to, uh, helping to massage things in that direction. So, you know, I'm not for war per se, for the sake of war, but when the war was on and we, were, and we were at the war, I believe we should have pursued it in a way that would have brought the British to, as I said, to, I'm probably repeating myself, but the Irish Republic should have been on the table. And when it's not, like, where are you going? But no, to simply continue a war for the sake of it, with no end in sight, no thing, no, no, no rational person would, would accept that, you know. But, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I mean, there shouldn't be a need for war at any stage because uh, according to um, the demographics, uh, I believe that unions are a majority now in only two of the 30, 32 counties of Ireland. So the vast majority of Irish people, you know, would want probably, would probably say, I'd imagine, I do believe actually that if you said to Irish people on a 32 county poll, do you believe that Irish constitutional authority should reside within the Irish people? Or do you believe it would reside some way in the British gown? I think, you know, I think I know what the answer would, it would be. And we have to remember, too, that partition wasn't brought in to protect the democratic right of unionists. Partition was brought in to deny the democratic right to Ireland as a whole to be one country. And remember, Britain treated Ireland as one country for hundreds of years. It always treated it as one political unit. And, 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 and unionists lived in United Ireland for hundreds of years with no problem at all. It's only when we talk about forging, uh, you know, a genuine republic, getting rid of sectarian supremacy, people start getting upset. Your book, um, John the Yank, very, very powerful memoirs going from before you joined the IRA, when you were in the IRA and after the IRA. And I mean, your journey with the IRA was in 1980 when you came to Ireland and you joined. When you were joining, you must have known that there was a possibility that you would be sent out to take someone's life. You know, had, yeah. had you thought yeah. about that? Of course I didn't. And uh, I, well, I mean, you know, I, I was a soldier. And all combatants on all sides of conflict kill. And uh, of course I was aware of that. So, I mean, I had to make a decision. Uh, uh, don't take that moral leap, save my own skin, or resist an armed group of gunmen who were quite willing to kill Irish people, you know, to maintain British rule in this country. So I believe, you know, that, you know, I, I made the right decision. And, you know, whether or not, you know, uh, I'm not going to discuss operation. I discuss one operation in the book, right? Well. I write of an incident that the British say never happened. And I'm just going to leave it at that. They say it didn't happen, and that's fine with me. Very interesting. Any, 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 anybody reading the book will, you know. Yeah. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, uh, they say it didn't happen. That's fine. But to ask for my own personal uh, view on it, um, I, would rather, um, I would rather have resisted than not resisted. And I'm glad I did. And I'm very proud, I'm very proud of the men and women, the vast majority that I served with. And uh, I only wish that, you know, we had the leadership that they deserved. I think we'd be in a different place today. Your book also goes into, you know, various incidents. And I mean, my goodness, it's nearly like a film script, John. 
I mean, you've had dealings with Boston-based um, Irish-American gangster James Whitey Bulger. You were involved in a huge arms shipment. You almost lost your life during that, that boat ride from America yeah. to Ireland. Um, you were arrested. You've been in jail twice for two different operations. The first one, the shipment. The second one was when you were involved in a plot to blow up um, the electricity network in, in London. How did you put all this down in, in, in one book? I mean, did it take long? Did it? No. And, and how did no. you feel about doing that? Because Well, you see, I, I never had an intention of writing a memoir. And having done that, that sounds a bit daft. But see, I wrote a, a novel. I spent about three years on it. And I thought it was pretty good, to be honest with you. But then I would, wouldn't I? But uh, when I was trying to get it published, I, uh, I uh, was having difficulty because the American publishers and uh, there was a fellow there who was a Hollywood screenwriter and all, and he was coming back and he was saying, my God, your story, we want to hear your story, your story, and then the hell with the novel. And I was saying, well, a lot of my story is in the novel, but it, names are changing also, and I could be more fr free. And, um, but anyway, to make a long story short, I canvassed some Republicans who I really trust, you know, Republicans who would have, you know, you know, and they were very encouraging, very encouraging, because, and my question was, how can I write a memoir without incriminating myself or anybody else, which I'm not going to do. As I said, I didn't keep my mouth shut in the barracks to spill my guts now. Now, I'm, I'm not, I am wasn't going to write a kiss and tell. But, and I hope I managed to do that, but you, you talk about me writing about things in the book, but but everything I write in the book, there, there's one there's one thing there that the Brits say never happened. Okay? Happy days, right? The rest of the stuff... I was either caught on or in, 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 on trial for or charged with. It's all a matter of public record. I have said nothing in the book about anything that I may or may not have been involved in that's not a matter of public record. So, you know, it's it's not an issue. I haven't named names, you know, and, and, and I don't, no, I haven't named names. I mentioned Martin McGinnis, but Martin McGinnis was the man who sent me to the States. And Martin McGinnis, unfortunately, and, you know, I, 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 I'm sorry to hear that he passed away. So he can't be charged with IRA membership. So I, I, I'm not, I can't incriminate the man. Uh, but I mean, you know, there's loads of other people that I haven't named for that very reason. I, there's no way I'm going to incriminate anyway. And I, I hope I haven't incriminated myself. I don't think I have, but, you know, it's early days. Tell me about Martin McGuinness. Um, like you say, he was the man who sent you mm -hmm. back to the States yeah. to get guns. Yeah. yeah. How did you meet him? Well, he, he he called for me. He heard about me and he called for me. And again, John Joes again. John Joes was sort of very central on the border, no matter where you were. I mean, just because I, you know, I was going to John Joes doesn't mean I was in that area. I could have been anywhere, but you'd be called to John Joes. John Joe was a good man, a very, very trusted Republican, very, very sound, dedicated Fenian. And uh, for some reason, Mark McGinnis uh, asked for me. I went to see him. I was starstruck. You know, I heard all these stories about Mark McGinnis. And I remember actually listening on the radio one day to a British uh, high-ranking officer saying Mark McGinnis was the IRA's greatest military thinker, and that he could have been trained at Sandhurst. He was so capable. So I met him, and clearly Martin was a uh, very intelligent, very, you know, uh, urbane fellow, was able to uh, get very articulate man, you know, but uh, he certainly didn't have the military ability or knowledge that I was led to believe. And uh, when he sent me to the States, uh, what sort of upset me was that he only his only interest in me the only asset he felt that i could bring to the struggle was that i had an american accent you know i had been an instructor in a special forces unit and i thought i could provide more help than that but no i mean uh, all he was interested in was my accent he says you can go into gun stores over there and you know buy guns and you have american accents not irish so you won't get suspicion so i actually refused to go i said i wasn't going i says for christ's sakes there's thousands of people over there in american accent and that you can get you know it but no I, uh, I was told you're going, so that was it. Now, <clears throat> I've been listening to a few reports lately, uh, and they're kind of saying, you know, Martin McGinnis sent me to, uh, you know, to work with Whitey Bulger. Martin McGinnis did not send me to work with Whitey Bulger. Martin McGinnis did not know Whitey Bulger. He'd never met Whitey Bulger. And um, he sent me to, 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 to Boston 
to to get weapons and set up a new arms network because we'd had setbacks and arrests in the states. And I met Whitey Bulger uh, through those contacts. Um, I didn't know who Whitey Bulger was. I mean, a lot of people now they're saying to me, oh, "How could you not have known Whitey Bulger?" That's fine. Now there's movies about him. There's books about him. There's everything about him. I wasn't from Boston. I didn't know anybody in Boston. I didn't know who Jim Bolger was. I'd never heard of him, you know. And all these stories about him that I'm hearing now uh, uh, are chilling me as much as maybe they chill a lot of people. Because he came across as a businessman, as somebody who was clearly willing to break the law and bend the rules, but not the mercurial psychopath that you hear about and read about now. I mean, he was murdering people and they were tearing their teeth out because there was no DNA then and stuff. I, he wasn't he wasn't telling me that. You know what I mean? He came across as a very plausible guy, you know, and he had resources that we needed. So it's easy to say in hindsight that, oh, you must have known this, you must have known that. We didn't know. We didn't know. And we wouldn't have worked with him if we did. I mean, does anybody seriously think that we would work with somebody that was maybe, you know, uh, helping us and then going out and murdering some woman and pulling her teeth out? Like, I mean, Jesus, you know, you know, people need to get a grip because, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't have, nobody would work with a guy like that. But we didn't know. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making excuses. I work with the guy. I'm not denying that for a second. I mean, I wrote about it in a book, but we did not know what he was doing when he wasn't with us. And he didn't come across as the menacing thug he's portrayed, like in a movie where it's constant menace, constant this. He, he, you know, you could have a laugh with him and things like that. But the only thing I, I found about him is... And I find this with some people with egos, and you, you see that a lot in some provosts. There's, they're incapable of self-deprecating humor. You know, there's an ego there, and uh, if you cross it, you know, they snap back a bit. And he was like that a bit, you know. He had to be careful and sort of respectful for him, but I, towards him. But I remember, uh, you know, him telling me about the Italian mafia in the North Boston. And he was saying, you know, he says, when the Italians say respect me, you know what they mean? He says, they mean fear me, fear me. That's what respect me means. But I thought to myself, now, Jim, you like a little bit of fear yourself, you know? So. Would Bulger have been sympathetic towards IRA or was it just business? No, no. It, it, no, he wasn't making any money out of this. It was costing him money. Right. I, I, I was asked this before, you know, what was his motivation? I can't really say because we didn't really discuss it. Uh, people had come over. I think he liked in the Irish American community in South Boston to be maybe known as a guy who was helping the IRA, you know, for whatever agenda he had on that. But uh, he, he certainly, he wasn't profiting from it. He definitely wasn't profiting from it uh, financially. Um, I remember him suggesting to me one time, uh, you know, if you got IRA guys on the run over there, you know, bring them over here. I'll get them IDs. I'll get them jobs. They'll be treated right. But I knew immediately what he was getting at. He saw himself with a small army of IRA hitmen over there under his control and thing. And that was never going to happen. I mean, that was, and I'd say, oh, oh yeah, Jim, that's a good idea. And we got to work on that. But Jesus, you know, I was thinking, get me out of here. <laughs> How long did you spend with him? Well, he'd have been up, he'd have been up most nights in the flat I was staying at with Patney, his, his, uh, his right hand man, one of his right hand men. But Patney was interested. Patney was from Ross Muck, came to Ireland, uh, America as a six year old, uh, speaking fluent Irish. I was in his house in South Boston. His parents were in the next room, fluent Irish speaking. So he was very, very, he was an ex US Marine too. And so we had that connection and he uh, was very pro IRA. Like he was, he was, his heart was in it. Well, Whitey's, Whitey's wasn't, wasn't necessarily, uh, there. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. You asked me yeah, that. How long did you spend with Whitey Bolton? Uh, well, off and on. Uh, it would have been a few months, but off and on. I wouldn't see him every day, anything like that. It was Pat and he was doing the hands-on work. Whitey gave the nod, sort of, but Whitey wasn't hands-on. But Whitey would come up for a report once, once in a while, and, you know, he'd start talking. And I say in the book, you know, like, Whitey was like a vampire. He only came out at night. You know, I'd be working all day, running around, and he'd come in maybe 10 o'clock, and I'm exhausted. And he'd be up till 2 o'clock, you know, and I'm fighting not to yawn or thing or nod, because, you know, if you did, he'd be really insulted, you know. And uh, you'd have to listen to him. But that incident in the basement, uh, I write about that in the book, because that put a real chill up my spine. Now, while we didn't know the nefarious activities he was getting, getting up to, I mean, I'd been around long enough at this time to heard, you know, about the Winter Hill mob war, 
you know, that Whitey had killed people in, in gangs. But to me, you know, you know, if, if criminals kill other criminals, you know, it was no skin off my nose, none of my business. I just need to, I'm working here for the IRA. That's your business. So, but I knew he was cap a capable killer. And I saw myself as a soldier, but he was a killer, a different kettle of fish. So he came down to the basement and I was drilling out the serial numbers on Armalites. And the serial number on Armalite is, is on the magazine well, so you can drill them out without affecting the weapon. It was just so they couldn't be traced if they were caught later. And he came down with Steve Flemmy. And he's the boy I later found out was the boy I used to pull the teeth, you know. So I'm in the corner of this dimly lit basement and they're talking. And they, they weren't aggressive and they weren't menacing. But I remember it like getting really paranoid. And I'm not a paranoid person. But I got, I, I got really worried because, you know, they wouldn't normally come down there. And they wouldn't normally come down on their own. And I just couldn't figure out what they were doing there. But you see, it was always in the back of my head somewhere that, you know, the IRA work was getting a little bit out of, out of hand, out of control. He probably meant to give a little help, and all of a sudden, this is what they were doing in a, in a big operation. And, you know, he probably, I was thinking, this guy will, 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 will realize at some stage this has to end because it's affecting his business. Uh, men like Patney, who should be working for him, were working with me. Uh, and also, I was making contacts with other Irish American, group, Irish American sort of organized crime groups in other parts of Boston. You know, just on the arms thing. And he didn't like, I don't think, Patney meeting with these guys in case. So he had a scheme in mind, and a scheme in mind I find always thinks everybody else is scheming. But you know, while I can't, you know, all these years later say 100% why, I just remember being in, in the corner drilling the numbers on these weapons. He comes down and like they're blocking me. You know, I'm in the corner of the basement. I can't get out. None of the weapons are loaded. And I remember thinking, I wish I had a loaded gun here because if these guys make a move, you know, I'm going to defend myself. And uh, they didn't. And they left. Uh, later on, I learned that John McIntyre was murdered in a basement and their bodies were buried in the basement. Now, since I presume these guys didn't have that many basements, I believe that was the same basement. So there would have been bodies buried under my feet from previous people they murdered, you know? Of course, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I mean, so much about Whitey, I'm learning 20 years after, 30 years after the fact. I didn't know this stuff at the time. But anyway, to answer your question, uh, I can't explain why I got such a, 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 a feeling of uh, concern, but I remember thinking, I'll be glad if I get out of this basement alive, you know? And, uh, and I do believe, I do believe, I have no doubt that if what I was doing had uh, caused him issues, that I would have disappeared. Yeah. I have no doubt. And I say in the book, I believe I would have ended up in a lobster pot at the bo bottom of Boston Harbor. And it was simple. The, when the IRA eventually sent somebody over to get me, all Whitey has to, to say was, Jesus, I give John $200,000 to bring over to you guys. Ain't you seen him? <laughs> you know, John headed to Vegas with the money, you know? So Please. yeah, it was, it, you know, I, I mean, and I'm not being, I'm not being overly dramatic. I have no doubt Whitey would have been capable of that if I was causing him issues, you know. Whitey Bulger helped you obtain 160 guns and 71,000 rounds of ammunition. Yeah, I, around it would have been around that number. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But that was that was nothing. That was nothing. I mean, you see, the strange thing about that operation was. We were planning a much bigger operation with a, with a much bigger boat. And we were well on, but it would have probably been the following spring before we could move. And uh, Liam Ryan, God rest him, a friend of mine, he, he'd gone home. He was later murdered by, well, UDR men who, who, loyalists, but they were in the UDR and they shot him. And they would have been working for IAC Special Branches, no question. But Liam was later murdered in the battery bar uh, in our boat. But um, at the time, uh, Liam was going over to meet several members of the leadership, and I sent messages back with him. And he came back then with uh, a very unusual thing, with a calm. I'm sure you know what a calm is, communication. And I, he, he, I was told to phone home, to phone a pay phone in Dublin, I think it was, at a certain time and a certain hour. And... That was very unusual to use phones in that manner, but, or, you know, those are my instructions. So I phoned and uh, the voice at the other end, who I didn't recognize, I don't know who was the other end, but it was obviously somebody representing somebody in the area leadership, I don't know who, said, you're to come home now with everything you've got and you be on the boat. 
And I remember it was really emphatic, you be on the boat. And I thought, I hung up the phone and I was absolutely, you know, uh, gobsmacked because why all of a sudden do I have to come home now? Why do I have to be on the boat? Like, I didn't mind being on the boat, but I was never supposed to be on it. Uh, I had I had all the knowledge. I had all the contacts. I had the whole thing. We were setting up much bigger stuff. And in fact, I say it in the book, we were to bring the stuff from Libya. We were to bring the, the gear from Libya into Ireland. Uh, but the boat we had and all was, all that went down the, when we were caught on the Marina. So, what I had to do then was I had to say to, to Patney and another man, they, they wanted me home now. I, I got to go home right now. So they got a fisherman called Bob Anderson and paid him $10,000, another guy $10,000 and some other inducements to take the fishing boat to Valhalla and take it across the Atlantic to meet up with another boat in the Port Kimpai Basin off the coast. So the gear we had, I, I know, you know, they made a big deal about the, the equipment on the Marina Anne, but the equipment on the Marina Anne would have been, made no difference to the IRA campaign one way or another. It would, it would have made no difference. It would have been nice for the IRA to have, but it would have made no difference. And yet I was told to come right now with, with this stuff and for me to be on the boat. So I was very keen when I got home to find out who gave that order. But we were, we were arrested. And I never found out. When Liam gave me the paper to ring home, in, in the way we operated, I didn't say to Liam, who told you? That? I know we met several members of the leadership. And I, I'm, to this day, I'm kicking myself that I never asked Liam who, who, who gave that order. So you don't know? I don't know, because Liam's dead. The IC Special Branch had him murdered. And uh, I, got, I got 10 years in jail. So I never found out. It, it makes no sense. It makes no sense uh, to get that order I got at the time. And you had spoken in the book about, I mean, you being told that only a small number of people know about this operation. And if anything gets out, it's on you because you've told somebody who isn't to be trusted. Well, it wasn't on Facebook. You know, <laughs> there was no Facebook at the time. But of course, I was told, of course, only a handful of men knew about this, of course, at a leadership level. And I remember being specifically told you know, you know, you know. If, if if things go wrong, you know, it's not going to be our end. It's going to be you. So you be careful because it's only a handful of men that know about this. And uh, I say in the book, which is the truth. I mean, when when, when uh, Jim Lyon was the first man on my cell, the first morning I was caught because he was the prison intelligence officer, and you know, an investigation was launched from the IRA and comms were going in and out of the jail. What happened and all? And the the assumption from the comms I was reading from the leadership was, you know. How was this caught? Who did you trust? What did you do wrong? And I remember thinking now, you know, you know, hold on a minute, right? I, we were given a longitude and latitude in the Porcupine Basin, 200 miles off the west coast of Ireland to meet a boat. I didn't know it was the Maridan. I didn't know anybody on the Maridan. So I had no idea the boat coming to meet us. I just knew the location, right? I didn't know where the boat was based. Uh, for all I knew, we could have been landing the guns in Donegal, Galway, Sligo, Waterford. I had no notion. Right? But the Irish Navy were waiting behind the Skellig Rocks so that the, the radar from the Marina Anne could not detect them on our way to Kenmore Mare Bay. Now, I didn't know we were going to Kenmore Bay, right? uh, but the Irish Navy knew, and I know I didn't tell them. And it later transpired that a uh, Tralee-based IRA man who turned informer, Sean yeah. O'Callaghan, yes. was the person. He was the person. He was the person. Who informed on him? I have no doubt he was an informer. There is no question, but he wasn't the person who told me to come now, bring everything, and you be on the boat. So you believe there was more than one informer? I do believe that. Yes, but I'm. I don't know who. I don't know who. I mean, that sailing in itself was frightening when you were going over. I mean, you got caught up in a hurricane. Horrendous. Like it's just. Um, um, the closest thing. <laughs> I, I'm sure you, you've seen that movie. Um, uh, George Clooney when the boat. I can't remember the name, yeah. but I have seen it. Yes, and, and that, like, like that. I seen it, and the sweat pumping out of me watching it because that's, that the boat was so similar, and that's exactly how it was. It was horrendous. Only it was mostly at night, and uh, I remember there was one day the sea was like glass. I mean glass. I never seen the and there was it, it, even on a fishing pond. I never saw calmer water, and. Uh, 
Bob Anderson, the captain, was saying that, that he was monitoring a hurricane coming up the Gulf Coast, and he said that was the calm before the storm. And I remember thinking, oh, I need, that's all I need. But I didn't anticipate how bad it would be. But when it hit, it was horrendous. And uh, we had lost our auto, autopilot on the way over, which means that somebody had to be in the wheel the whole time. Uh, and uh, it was basically myself, Bob Anderson, and John McIntyre, who was later murdered, who were on the wheel. I think it was four-hour shifts. It was the middle of the night. I was steering the boat through the most horrendous waves, crashing. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, couldn't imagine we were going to get out of this. The boat was. You had these, um, these. Uh, I forget what you call them in the water. And every every time, I th I kept thinking we were going to flip over every time the boat went. It was nearly touching the water every time. And so at one point, uh, I gave the wheel to Bob, and that, as I say in the book, saved our lives, and it did because the rogue wave that hit us hit when Bob was on the wheel. If any, if I'd been the wheel or anybody else, there's no way because we wouldn't have known what to do. Now, not only were there, was there tempered glass uh, windows in the pilot house, but they, Bob had them extra strengthened before he left and four of the seven broke and they're not supposed to break, right? Four of the seven came in, he was cut, water went down to the engine room where the guns were stored, caused a short circuit. So. It's the picture I got. I still it felt like a car collision. I was in the bunk, couldn't sleep, and I was thrown violently forward like a car collision. I stumbled out of the bunk, out into this little vestibule, and there's water pouring around my ankles. There's smoke pouring up from the engine room and a fire where the guns are. Bob's bleeding like a stuck pig at the wheel, and the windows are gone. Right, and I just think, well, we're dead. We're dead, you know. And I remember thinking, you know, I wonder will my family ever learn what happened to me because nobody knows we're here. But uh, thankfully, Bob's wounds weren't uh, catastrophic. Uh, and he had managed to hold onto the wheel on his knees and somehow steer us out of the spin that would have flipped us. I mean, but he saved our lives. And um, gradually, oh yes, and, and a, a point I make in the book is we had brought survival suits. So I know we're going down. and. Uh, I said to Bob, Bob, should we put on the survival suits? And Bob just looked at me and he gasped through his pain. He just he nearly laughed at me. He says, nobody knows we're here. You know, we have no communications. We're in the middle of the North Atlantic. He says, put it on if you want to, but it's just going to take you eight hours longer to die. You know, and I looked at him and I says, there's no point putting it on. Wow. You know, you know, and we didn't put them on. But I remember thinking that that's, and I just couldn't imagine that we were going to survive that night. Uh, one more such wave. I mean, the windows were gone, so we had no hope. But somehow, somehow, the storm eventually abated and, and we, we, we were able to limp our way on. And uh, we had lost our communications. We would lost our, our, our navigation, because it's called low round navigation. We brought two of everything, but when the water came in and broke the waves, it short-circuited and it caused... But after two days, John McIntyre, who did sterling work to get us through it, because we couldn't have gone on and met the Marie Dan because we had no nav navigation or communication. But after two days, one radio came back and one Loran navigation device came back. So we were able to continue on our journey. And uh, John was able to get plywood from somewhere. There must have been a storage thing or something. I don't know where he got it, but he was able to plywood up the windows. And we had, I think, three windows left out of seven. So we're half blind staring at it like this, you know. But we, we eventually met up with the Marie Anne. But yeah, it was a horrendous experience now. I tell you, I wouldn't like to do it again. <laughs> so you were arrested along yeah. with three other people, including uh, Martin Ferris, who went on to become a Sinn Féin TD. Yes. You were sentenced to 10 years in prison. Yes. And you spent that in Port Leash prison? I did, yes. You came out of prison? Yeah. Still a dedicated IRA man? Yeah. Well, mo mo most IRA volunteers came out of prison dedicated IRA men. But uh, it was also 10 days after the ceasefire. Really? And uh, I had done every day of my time because I, I got extra. I got also three years extra for an attempted escape in '85. And uh, between the two remissions, I ended, ended up doing. So I went in in September '84 and I came out in September '94. But it was ten days after the ceasefire. Yeah, yeah that's the first ceasefire. Yeah, yeah. The first ceasefire. And I remember a lot of people saying to me, "Oh, you got out of the ceasefire?" I says, "No, I did every single day of my time." So of course things were in a flux. Didn't know what the hell was going on, and you know and. You know, you know, some people are saying, oh, we, we, we brought the Brits to the negotiating table and we fought the Brits to a standstill and all this delusional nonsense. But again, um, I couldn't get a read on it because, you see, I was OK with the ceasefire and I was OK with as long as it would lead to Republican goals. I mean, 
you, 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 if there's a chance to do things peacefully, you have to explore that, and you have to, you know, you have to, you have to, 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 to try that. But um, you also have to reach your goals. You have to reach your political goals. And uh, so uh, one thing led to another, and the ceasefire broke down, and I ended up in England on active service in England because me and some other fellas had come up with a plan to uh, disrupt the electricity grid. Uh, we, we, you know, um, earlier attacks in London, such as the Bishopgate bomb and the and and the um, the bomb at Baltic Exchange uh, in the heart of the London Financial Centre, had caused more financial and economic damage to England than um, the 10,000 10, explosions in the North during the whole length of the Troubles. And again, we were focusing on you know economic and financial targets, not civilian. We wanted to basically make uh, Ireland not worth it for England to stay here, right? And London, I think, controls something like 25, 26% of the gross domestic product for the entire UK. So putting the lights out for any period of time would have cost them, I mean, uh, billions, if not trillions. So that was the plan. And again, we, 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 we were caught again, and I deeply suspect an informer there. We actually caught on the job or we were arrested at night in 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 in, in houses in safe houses over there uh, but we had no um we had no explosives with us and uh they tried to say we were this a team sent over by the leadership you know to do this and that we were we weren't sent over by the leadership the leadership didn't know anything about our operation you see people have this real misconception about the ira that the leadership had some strategy or they didn't have any strategy that I could see. In fact, they ended up internalizing a British strategy in the Good Friday Agreement. But what the, what the leadership would do, and, and don't get me wrong, there were some good people in leadership too. I, you know, there were some fine men on that too. My, 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 uh, my, my annoyance is a, is a small handful at the core of it. But there were good men. There were good men there too. And uh, uh, men who did more in the struggle than I ever did. So, I mean, I cannot take that away from them. Right. But um, what the leadership would do was they would decide whether you go to war or have a ceasefire. Once they decide it's war, it's up to the t men on the ground, the teams, to use their initiative to fight the war. I mean, so I remember, you know, one time reading somebody said, well, you know, the proof positive that the IRA leadership was never infiltrated by British intelligence is that these operations went off in England. The, the area leadership didn't know anything about those operations in England, no details whatsoever. They would have known operations in England were going to take place. They would have known that the war was continuing, of course, but they didn't know the specifics of operations. So that you wouldn't have had to have gone to the leadership to get permission to do something like that? No, no. You, 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 I mean, you knew, you, you knew what not to do. You know, don't endanger yourself, and it still happened. But, you know, but no, you didn't... There, there was... What we'd have done is gone to... The uh, head of the England department on GHQ staff, who was, in my opinion, one of, the, one, of the, one of the finest volunteers I ever met. And he would have provided the resources. He would have known that we were going to attack the grid, but he didn't know the specific targets. Even he didn't know the details. He just had a general idea that we were going to try to do some infrastructural damage over there to create economic and financial uh, cost to the British state, to the UK state, for being in Ireland. and uh, But no, even he didn't know the detail. And the Army Council certainly didn't know. And if they didn't know, I wouldn't have gone. You know, because uh, you don't want people knowing something that you're doing. You know? But still, somebody knew, because I, I, we were informed on. You know, we were definitely informed on. I know some people don't, they have their doubts in that. Some members of might, might, might believe we weren't, but I firmly believe we were. I have my reasons for believing that, and I can't really go into detail on that. Uh, you know, it's, you know, um, yeah, they, yeah. They, they knew, they knew we were there. Yeah. And you got 35 years? Got 35 years for that. What year was that? That was 96. I got the 35 years. Wow. Yeah. And did you expect, or did you know at that stage, did you expect to, to spend the full 35 Absolutely. years? Of, you did? Of course I did. I had no idea about a second ceasefire. I thought they tried the ceasefire, it didn't work. We went back to war and now we're back at war. But I fully expected to do the 35 years unless we won in the meantime, uh, which I, I, I hoped we'd win in the meantime. But I didn't expect I'd be home in Ireland again in four years and out of jail again. Certainly not. Certainly not. And I even had an approach from the CIA when I was over there to become an informer, 
which was uh, in the book as well. Really? Uh, what oh, happened yeah. was, and it, this was rather slippery of them, uh, the day before the second ceasefire, which I, well, of course, none of us knew anything about, I was approached by uh, a prison officer and told, you have representatives here from the American Embassy who want to talk to you. And I said, okay. I said, but I, my exact answer was, well, you know, I have nothing against the United States, but I'm a citizen and I'm a soldier of the Irish Republic. I, and uh, if I want to see uh, anybody from an embassy, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the, to, the, to the Irish embassy. And even though, I mean, we had our problems with the Irish government, I still had an Irish passport, you know. So if I had embassy issues, I would deal with them. And so that was fine. He went away and I thought I was forgot about it. But he came back an hour later and he says, they told me to tell you, you will want to meet with them. And I thought, now this is something. What is this about? And then I thought it was maybe a threat to extradite me to America over the Whitey Bulger thing. And I just couldn't figure what it could possibly be. And uh, uh, I thought, well, extradition doesn't make sense. I'm just starting a 35 year sentence. Unless they're telling me after your 35 years, you're coming over here. I didn't know. So the two of the other lads in the prison, I, I spoke to and I asked them their opinion. And he says, now, if you think if, if it's inappropriate, I won't go. And they both said, look, at, find out what they want. It's no problem, what's gonna happen? So I says, okay. So I went out and there was a man and a woman there. And the, ma the woman who was sitting there projected an air of absolute contempt towards me. I mean, you could tell she didn't want to be there and she probably would have burned me at the stake. The second guy was very friendly and very personable and very amiable. But she spoke first and asked me, did I have any problems or issues with the prison? I says, no. I says, no, it's, it's great. Food's great. We get plenty to read and all this. You see, I knew what she was getting at. She wanted me whinging and whining and begging to get out there. So I was making out, like, like I said in the book, that I just got a 35-year ticket to the Playboy Mansion. And what prison were you in, John? That was white more special white security unit. Now, I don't want to be flippant about it. I did not want to be there, and I hated every second. But I wasn't going to go start whinging and whining and trying to get out uh, and do deals because, you know, that just, I wasn't going to do that. So anyway, she got nowhere and she says, oh, you certainly don't have much to complain about. Oh, she was ripping. But then the other guy, he reached out. He was a very suave, sophisticated looking guy, a tall, fine looking man, crown coat, gray hair, very distinguished looking, reached out across and he says, John, he says, I'm with a different agency. Well, the second he knew that, I, I knew what he meant. He was with the CIA. So he tried to, he says, he, he says, I've been following your career with some interest. So anyway, to me, you know, it's in the book, but he, they, they, they tried to offer me uh, a lot of money. He didn't specifically say a lot of money, but he says, John, we can leave the visiting box right now. He says, you don't even have to go back into the prison. We can leave right now. He yeah. says, yeah, we, and I, we can have you on a plane in America tomorrow. And he says, and we're willing to offer you a lot of money. And he leaned forward and he kind of winked and he says, John, a lot of money. He says, all you have to do is tell us where the explosives are hidden. So I said, you know, are you aware I've already done 10 years in prison? He says, yeah. I says, well, then you're aware. I says that I know what's ahead of me. I says, I've been through it before. I says, I'm not going to come the hard man now and be begging to see you next year. I says, as soon as I go in, I'm going to report this to the lads. I'm going to report it to Dublin. I'm going to report it to my solicitor so that you never again approach me with this bullshit. So uh, they left. And as he was leaving, I says, you shook my hand coming in here. Will you not shake it now? So he smiled and he shook my hand. And I kind of says, you know, I kind of smiled at him and I says, uh, maybe we'll meet up in 35 years and swap a few war stories. And he says, maybe we will. He was, he was nice, he was, he, was, he was okay, you know. He says, maybe we will, you know. And then I says, I, I says, tell you what, I says, I'll give you some information right now. I says, I'll tell you how to get rid of the IRA. I says, you tell your British friends to pull out of Ireland and allow us to build the national democracy free from their influence. And I guarantee you, the IRA will be gone overnight. And I'll tell you something else. I says, I am not going to charge you one penny for that information. Right. What did he say? He just smiled. He smiled. He just went. And I went in. I reported to the lads. I phoned the Dublin prisoner's office in Dublin and reported the attempt to recruit me. And then I phoned my solicitor, Mike Fisher, who I recently learned has died. God rest him because he was a lovely, lovely man. And I reported that. So, you know, uh, they were never going to approach me again because once you report, you know. And the next day, the IRA called the second ceasefire, which I had no idea was common. And now I know why they were so anxious to see me on that day. Because... Uh, they knew. When I went in there, I thought I was there for 35 years. It's easy in hindsight now, you know, sitting here at the table with you, Patricia, yeah. and talking about this and, la you know, sort of maybe half laughing about it. But when I went to see them, as far as I knew, I was doing 35 years in prison. Yeah. So you, you came out in 1999, was it? May 2000. Everything had changed, John. Yeah.
When did your attitude start changing? Because, I mean, you spoke earlier in the podcast about your feelings towards the leadership now. Yeah. You know, when did that, you know, I don't want to say transformation, but that change start to happen? When I, gre- when I eventually read the Good Friday Agreement, because you see, I didn't read it. And almost everybody that I know that voted for it, they didn't read it either. But when I, when I, you know, I'm not being, I'm not being, uh, I, I know people read it and said, but I, look, at, I know lots of people told me they voted for it. No, I never read the freaking thing. You know what I mean? And so when I actually read it and studied it and started to see stuff in that, in the British Irish Agreement, that you maintain the British Irish thing, even into United Ireland, like wh- where, where's our democracy? Where, where's our national liberation? If the British can strike deals now that we have to maintain, even when we have our so-called independence, it was a lot of things like that. It was a lot of things like that. And uh, it was gradual. Now, I just didn't flip, flip overnight and say, oh my God, this is wrong. It took a long time for the penny to drop, you know, but policing for me, was the final straw when when they recognized the lawful authority of a British constabulary in, in our country as the lawful authority and they were telling people to inform to them to give them information things like that for me you know that was uh, that was it it was time to get out of dodge how did you then um and I, I you know you've, you've written about this in the book but how did the did you then have to kind of re in a way rebuild your life because everything that you believed in and the people that you looked up to and who you took orders from or whatever we're now suddenly on a different path than what you were on. Well, you would think that. You would think that. But I remember a, a, a relative of mine used to visit me in Port Leash from time to time. And when I told them I'd resigned, and they said to me, oh my God, you must be devastated. You gave your life to this and all this and all this. And, uh, you know, it just must be terrible for you. And I says, you know what? I says, it's like an anchor has been lifted off my shoulders. I says, never again will I have to go into a Sinn Féin meeting and listen to that delusional bullshit as long as I live. I felt great, Patricia, delighted, because I maintained my integrity and my, uh, and my republicanism, and I didn't have to uh, pretend I was something I wasn't, you know. And uh, so I've lost, you know, I've lost friends, but I've gained new ones, and uh, I still retain friends. The funny thing about the Sinn Féin thing, I find, is that I, I have a lot of friends who would still be in Sinn Féin who would be very, we'd be very respectful for each other. Just, just don't get into politics, right? But we respect each other because we, we, we knew the caliber of men and women we were in our day. And you can't take that away from them, you know? Uh, and there's a, there's, there's, you know, there's, you know, there's a friendship there. But uh, I find the new Sinn Féiners, the young ones who have drank the Kool-Aid on this totally uh, would hang you. A person like me, they'd string, they'd, they'd, you're, they'd string you up, you know? You know, they've totally, as the Americans say, drank the Kool-Aid and the whole thing. They're like, they're like zombies. They're like a cult, I swear to God. Uh, and uh, it's, it's bizarre. It's bizarre, I find, the way some of them have just bought into this. This notion of this uh, united, you know, this idea that the struggle for Irish freedom was to end partition. Well, partition's only 100 years old. If the struggle for Irish freedom was to end partition, then why was there a rising in 1916 when there was no partition? Why did the United Irishmen form in 1791 when there's no partition? And what did they mean by United Ireland? Sure, the United Irishmen, Ireland was geographically united. It was uniting Irishmen under the common name of Irishmen, of, uh, of uh, getting rid of, uh, of sectarian division and forming a joint civic identity. Yes, keep your diversity, keep your culture, you know, keep what, what matters to you in life, unless what matters to you in life is sectarian supremacy. And I have no uh, apologies or, or, or tears to shed if you lose that. Would you have joined IRA had you have known what happened with the Good Friday Agreement and, uh, and the things that you disagree with? Absolutely not. I would never have joined the IRA because when I joined the IRA, do you remember Martin McGuinness, 1986, the famous Ardesh, stay, stay with us, we will lead you to the Republic. Where is the Republic? The Republic isn't even on the table. It's not on the table. Anybody wants to read the Good Friday Agreement or the, or, or the, uh, the uh, Northern Ireland 1998 Constitution Act or the uh, British Irish Agreement, it's all online. Anybody, if, anybody, uh, if anybody can find the Irish Republic in any of that stuff, let me know. I, I'm, I'm all ears. You know, no, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have because um, I'm all okay for. Again, I, you know, I, I'm for peace. I'm for peace, but um, you know, 
You see it as a flawed agreement. I see it as a flawed agreement because, uh, you know, because Republican goals are not there. And it was never a Republican goal to unite Ireland with the sectarian dynamic intact, with a section of our people being treated as some post-colonial rump who will maintain this institutional link in some way to the British royal family, you know. Uh, that's what Martin McGuinness was saying when he shook the hands of the Queen on Irish soil, a person who um, uh, claimed sovereignty in our country and was saying this is about reconciliation. But what, were we, what, what are we reconciling ourselves to? We're reconciling ourselves to continue division and to continue. You see, there's a lot, lot of, you know, people like to think, oh, the Irish people fought for their freedom and they did this and this great resistance over hundreds of years. I mean, the vast majority of Irish political culture comes from like uh, the constitutional end or the so-called constitutional end because there is no British constitution on paper. But you know, um, it's how can we be worthy of a place at the table? How can we make ourselves worthy of self-rule? You know, Daniel Connell used to say, we're ready to become a kind of West Britain if we can just have equality, if we could just be at your table. Uh, Redmond, uh, First World War, we'll send the manhood of Ireland into the trenches. They had a grand uncle killed there in 1916. And, and, and to prove that we're worthy of self-rule, that we're worthy to sit at the table. And we don't want sovereignty. You know, we, we, you can't eat a flag. We just want equality within the empire. And now we're sort of back to this, really, which is a, a bigger Irish tradition than ever resistance was, is we're saying to Unionists, how can we be worthy of your presence in our country? How, how can, can we get rid of the flag? Can we get rid of the anthem? How, how can we be worthy? Instead of how can we live together? as citizens in equality, you know, a real legal and constitutional equality. No supremacy, no sectarian division. Uh, yes, diversity. Diversity is great. I don't want everybody to be, you know, you know, if I didn't like diversity, then all the paint in my house would be the same color. You know what I mean? Of course, uh, I like diversity. I love meeting people from different cultures. I love meeting all kinds of people uh, with different views, and uh, but uh, I believe that uh, you should only have, uh, the Irish nation should have one national loyalty, and that's to a democratic republic within an all-Ireland context. And that is not in, that is not on the table in the future disunited Ireland of the Good Friday Agreement. And uh, people say, well, we have peace, well, we have certainly have pacification, but we have peace, and yes, we have peace, but uh, I don't believe the root cause of uh, why there was war in the first place has, has been addressed, which is British jurisdiction. It's another very important thing to remember is this. When the Good Friday Agreement was signed up to, we were told by John Hume, Bertie Ahern, and all in Sundry that we had now, the consent had been recognized, that Really, the British had recognized that it was, it was the, the consent of the Irish people, North and South, to come together. And it was their decision now in future, and the British didn't really have this role. But cases taken in, 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 uh, in, the, in the Northern High Court in 1916, the McCord case on the European vote and on the, on the Brexit, and in the, in the uh, I think it's the Mitchell case in London in uh, the following January, the British courts have made it very clear that Westminster parliamentary su supremacy overrides anything in Ireland, that the Westminster parliament is sovereign, right? So the, basically the argument was, well, the people in the North voted to, for Brexit, I mean, in, uh, against Brexit, and that should be recognized. And the, Brit the British have said, no, no, parliament is sovereign, you know? So we have this bizarre situation. And I know a lot of people don't sit down, they're getting on with lies, they don't analyze this stuff to death. But we have this bizarre situation where the Irish people, we, we were told, have made a, a, an electoral choice. In the North, they voted for the multi-party agreement, in the South, they voted to remove Articles 2 and 3. They've made this electoral choice, and we're told that is democracy. But the British government are the only ones with the power to, to make the political decision. See, on a border poll... Any electoral choice the Irish people make is irrelevant because a border poll rests in the gift of a member of the British cabinet, an Englishman, who doesn't have one single vote in this country, north or south. That's his decision. So if people say that's democracy, that's fine, but it's not like any democracy I ever heard of. But there you go. John, as a man of peace, you've described yourself. Yeah. 
I'm sure you've had a lot of time to reflect over the years of, of what's happened. I mean, during the conflict, the troubles, whatever you want to call it, 3,000 lives were lost. Um, the IRA um, killed many military people, but they also killed innocent civilians, as did other paramilitaries and as did the security forces. Have you ever reflected on those lives lost? Well, I know a lot of lives that were lost. I mean, I, I've lost a lot of friends. And... Uh, of course, but I take, you can take an emotional view of it, and which is good too, because it, it, you know, a kind heart takes an emotional, empathetic view, of course, it's a human thing. But I sort of also take the strategic view that if the British government weren't interfering in our country, if they keep their nose out of here and quit uh, constantly trying to shape the strategic environment to suit them, you would have had none of this. You would have had none of this. So while the IRA, uh, sh uh, when it was active, needed to be careful and needed to be cautious uh, and things had done and, and, and bad things happened, the reality of it was none of this would have happened if the British government were in Ireland. And I don't believe that senior British military intelligence and security officers are sitting at a table worrying about who they killed over here. You know, I, I, you know, so at some stage, you just got to, uh, you, 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 you just got to, uh, you know. It's hard to kind of put into words. It's hard to put, it, put into words because you look at, you know, if somebody, if somebody lost a family member killed by the IRA, the IRA is saying they didn't mean to do it. That's only adding insult to injury. You know what I mean? There's no way around that. There is no way to reconcile somebody to uh, the death of a loved one by any organization. I mean, what are they going to say? Oh, it's a, a good job and I'm glad the boys got away. You know, for Christ's sakes, you know, the reality of it is. But if we could just deal with the root cause that there would never be violence again, which is to build a national civic identity in this country and, and, and really then build this country. And yes, and I keep saying this, Ulster unions are a distinct, they're a distinct community. There's no question. But they are not a separate nation. And they should not be treated as a separate nation. And at some stage, we have to become one nation again. And I mean, the song isn't, you know, I mean, Robert Emmert didn't say, let my country take its place among the two nations and the nations of the earth. It was as a nation among the nations of the earth. And he was a Protestant. And there were many Protestant patriots. And while I know that there are people in the North, especially who on the 12th of July every year celebrate Ireland's defeat, celebrated the start of the Protestant ascendancy and all that led to the penal laws, the, 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 the landlord system, you know, the, the famine, all the misery that that l l left in Ireland as a whole. They celebrate that every year. But I'm also aware that Republicanism began with Northern Presbyterians. And because in the first instance, they're motivated by plantation Protestants Protestantism, and 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 the second instance, they were motivated by Enlightenment Protestantism, right? And uh, I would hope that at some stage, the Enlightened Protestantism of the United Irishmen can one, once again flourish and come to the fore, because it has been a tremendous benefit to our country, and it's it's inspired me. It's inspired me far more than Catholic nationalism has, which I I, I actually am repelled by, to be honest with you.